if you rang around with four um, burglars, guess who's the fifth one, mate? I started, beca I, I became a heroin addict, obviously, uh, this is where we're going, so I started hanging around with these people who sold drugs, uh, sold heroin, sold crack. Yeah, yeah there was a fight on there the one time. I, I'll go back to this now, but there was a fight on there the one time, right? And one of the boys was just pissing on the other lad down there when they were fighting. The screws, right? This big fat, big fat screw come on, like after the damage is done, right? Bang up, boys. Just like. Don't give a shit. They just don't give a fuck Let up you here. I thought you would, get, you would get murked up here. Do you know what I mean? You're going to, like, if, some, if someone wanted to kill you up here, you're getting killed. End of. Like, it's that serious up there then. Yeah. Welcome yeah. to jail, boy. Hey, Callum, thanks for coming in. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much, mate. Appreciate you making the drive down. It's a lovely drive to Crick Howell. Yeah. Am I allowed to say that, where we are? Or? Yeah, of course you are, mate. I don't think I'm at the stage where people are going to start turning up in my house, so <laughs> I think that's a fucking long way off. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a lovely, lovely part of the part of the country. Yeah. Um, Abergavenny, Crickow, Brecon. Obviously, really nice. I come across you on uh, Instagram and dug a little bit deeper and found out you've got a really impactful story to tell. Yeah. So I thought, got to have you in, mate. Got chatting to you. Kind of feel like I got to know you a little bit, to be honest. Yeah, and, uh, yeah most definitely. Seemed like a great guy. And uh, But it hasn't, you haven't always uh, been in this positive mindset. So, well, I want to break it down, go back to the start with you. Okay. And talk about, like, sort of, where'd you grow up and what did that look like? Okay, so, um, originally I'm from Cardiff, a place called Fairwater, Cardiff West. Um, <clears throat> born on any ordinary council estate, a loving family. Um, some of my friends didn't have that, but I had a good family. Parents, I'm, a, I'm the oldest of two. I have a younger brother, Bradley. Um, and, yeah, growing up growing up was really good. I've got to be fair, um had a relative in my family who had a bad name for himself that kind of stuck to me as well going through school but as a family um a family network my family were really good and they still are to this day there's not a in this day and age there's not many families who still have parents who are still married i don't know if they're happily married but they're still together and um it's still going strong now yeah so it's a rarity definitely isn't it? and I'm in, I'm in the same position and i think like having that that strength around you definitely like kind of install some sort of morals as such, I'd say. I don't know, but it definitely shows you, like, it does. you can do that. It does, it does, because even at my lowest, and people might laugh at this, there might be people out there who think, nah, I seen you at your worst, but trust me, I had morals. I did. I didn't, you know, there's certain things I didn't do, which obviously played a strong part from my family bringing me up. Yeah, so obviously that was all looking good, and then, what, well, going into your teenage years, like, I... Was that when things started to sort of take the yeah, turn? Yeah, so mine, <coughs> yeah, so mine's like a mixture of my mental health, which I kind of mass for uh, so long, and then addiction um, is kind of how things went really bad. But they both played off each other. So it was my mental health to start, which I did not um, understand. Um, I knew it was there, but I just didn't know how to kind of come to terms with it really, and just let it all out and, and, and seek help, seek the right help, which yeah. is what I'm trying to like stress to a lot of people now. Um, <clears throat> so when I was in high school, it started to show. So basically I, I'm uh, diagnosed with severe OCD, ADHD. Um, I went in prison. They tried um, diagnosing me with bipolar. But when I came out and I spoke to doctors, they were pretty unsure. And I haven't gone. Obviously, you've got to realise I was through a reckless um, stage in the last 10 years of my life. So every time I would go to these places, they'd always say, until you tackle your drug use, we can't tackle your mental health. We can't assess yeah. you properly. So I was always in that route, uh, that you know vicious cycle. So the OCD and ADHD were at a younger age. I was, um, well, I knew it was there. People knew it was there. Um, but it was only later on until I got diagnosed with them. So, um, growing up in school, uh, I was very, very like popular kid. Everyone loved me. Um, I wasn't a bad kid. I never started smoking fags till year nine. Um, I remember like uh, my friends would go on the knock and smoke fags, and I'd be taking the mick out of them, saying, yeah. like, "You know, what are you smoking for, you idiot?" Like, always into my sports: football, rugby, baseball in the summer. Um, 
uh, sort of skating. I think there was this, I, I, you might have remembered as well, there was like a stage where everyone used to go rollerblading. I used to have my laser blade rhinos, roller yeah, disco. I remember it. I wasn't very good at it, mine, i got to be honest. <laughs> like, I was fucking on my ass more than yeah, I was on yeah, the blades. Yeah. Like, Well, they're back now, aren't they? But there's like the ones with like the four the four blades. I, I was the ones with just the straight the straight roller yeah, blades. Yeah, everyone's got, like, Tearing up the streets with them. Like, yeah, yeah, I was good, man. Well, I was I more of a scooter. Was. Like, I felt like a bit more stable on a scooter. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, yeah. So, like, obviously, um, I was into all that. and But I started realising I was always, like, a, a, a homey person, like, a kind of a baby, like, um, you know, wanted to stay home. Uh, if I stayed over friends, I'd be crying, ringing my mum and dad, oh, I want to come home, like, you know. And I remember year seven, we went to Land Granog with the school, and um, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to go on, uh, go away, like. But it was the moment I got on the bus, and we were on the bus with all the boys, and they all waving go- goodbye to our mum and I, like, outside the high school. I know it sounds mad, but it was high school. Um, as soon as we got up there, like, I'm like, oh, where's my mum? I want to go home, like, it was... I don't know, and I remember that night I was crying. On, I, like I had to tell the teachers, and they took me in this like room, and I'm ringing. I, I remember crying like to my mum and dad. They're like, "What is the matter with you?" And I'm like, "I just want to come home. I don't know what's the matter." Like, and uh, I'll never forget it. Like, I was in like this room, like, and it was like window pane, and then all my mates and I were playing snooker in this like rec room, and they're looking at me like, "What's the matter?" I'm like, oh. it, "It was that part of like your mental health." Yeah, OCD, I, I, do you think? Well, or? maybe I was just a big sap. I don't know. Like, but that, <laughs> that, that's what it was. Like, that's how I was. Um, and then it definitely played into my anxiety and OCD then later on into life because um, I started to, like, do certain ritualistic things. Like, my mind would tell me to do these certain things to make sure my mother and father would be okay. So my dad was a taxi driver growing up as well, and he used to work nights on the weekends. So every night, like, he'd be working. Like, I'd be, like, 12, when I'd be waking up, man, ring dad, make sure he's okay. Like, really? I, like, yeah, it was one of them. Like, I don't know why, like, but that's how I was. Um, just constantly worried about bad things. Happening, yeah, you know? just worried about. It was like that anxiety constantly. Something bad's gonna happen to one of your loved ones, or one of your friends, or to yourself. And um, that 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 really played a a big part of my growing up. And then, um, like 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 you say, um, what we we used to say, like. Um, my friends kind of justified in his school and they were going on the knock like, yeah, well, I'm going to just mess about it. Uh, you know, as long as when my GCSEs come year 10 and 11, I'll knuckle down. But for now, we're going to mess about. But like year seven, eight and nine, that was, m- I was the good kid. And then year 10 and 11 came round. And when they all started to start knuckling down, I started being nuts and I discovered cannabis, weed, you know, and started smoking weed and, Drinking on the weekends, as you do as a kid, like, you know, with all yeah, the boys. It's just, and it's just what everyone does, though, isn't it? I think, like, yeah. and a lot of people be lying to themselves if they haven't tried to, tried things out when they were younger, like. No, exactly. Um, but if you look back now, and, um, like, a lot of boys and girls who was in my year in school, like, w- over the years when I've seen them, they always said, you know what, Carl? If there was one person I thought would have took drugs to that extent or uh, had a bad life, it would never have been you. Just from like the way, even when I was smoking weed, and I like I'd have to make sure I had deodorant to smell because my mum would kill me, and make sure I had chewing yeah. gums, and like I was that, you know, and and like even you know even when like it comes to the stage where I would I wanted to go camping with the boys now, my mum and dad were the ones who were like, no, you're not going camp. Like you know, my my mum was I, I think like, my mum's quite worrying as well. Like she's one of them ones, you know, if you go on holiday, like and like you put your foot in the sea, she's like, get out, it's gonna be a shark. <laughs> you're gonna but get she, stung. <laughs> yeah, just nuts, like yeah. you know what I mean, and, may, and maybe that's. Part of it, like, well, I think they reckon, don't they? The first seven years of your life is where you build like your confidence or your character or whatever, and in your life goes in like seven year cycles. They reckon so, like, if you can break the cycle in seven years, your next seven will be good. So, they reckon the first seven, though, is like the crucial one which builds your confidence yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you've had like, and it's no no fault of your mum's as such, no, no, but that is. Well, they reckon, you know, she's selling, oh, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Then, like, as you're going on for your life, like, that's just ingrained in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, do you know what? And uh, do you know what, Joe? You might be right, because <coughs> as much as my mum, she would probably kill me if she's going to watch this, <laughs> but as much as my mum is amazing, yeah, um, growing up, when she, like, my auntie and my nan's tell me when she had me, she was really ill. So is it like that PTSD thing they have when they yeah. have, like, and apparently, like, she can, like, can deal with me I was the first I don't know why but um, I used to spend a lot of time at my grandmother's only lived around the corner my granny Charlotte God rest her soul well I say that she's still alive but she's in hospital now oh, as we speak that, it's okay yeah. but um, I think she'll, she's okay like but I always used to go to her house um, so she, you know I was staying here quite quite a lot over the weekends and sometimes in the weeknights because she was literally around the corner um, she moved to Northampton uh, later on in, later on in, in my life like but um, 
yeah, she, like she was a big part of it. So maybe you're right there. Like uh, maybe um, where I was so worrying with my parents and I maybe it's because I weren't, you know, my mother weren't very maternal to me as that age. Maybe yeah. you're right. I, I yeah, don't they know, reckon like know? we reflect our parents' actions in a way yeah, without even knowing it. We like to think we're our own person <laughs> growing up and we're just, no, this is my thoughts. This is my thought. But really, we're just like a reflection of them in a yeah, way. Exactly. I think you can break it, you know. Oh, most definitely. Th- and you yeah. can change. But I also think like, well, if it's some first seven, I think, like, like you said, like um, the next seven would be up to like fourteen, fifteen. So maybe that played that 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 yeah. role in them days growing up in school and stuff. You know, um, maybe that year nine, ten, where you started to change was the next the seven. Next seven. Then, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know what? I mad you say that. Like, um, you might be right there, mate. So where were we? Um, so yeah, I'm in school, year nine, ten, eleven, starting to um. Let me let me take it back a minute, right? Because yeah, yeah, go for it. <clears throat> there's there's factors into this, yeah. So growing up, yeah. So you had my father, my mother. My mother's side was like on the other side of Cardiff. The Maces are mainly Fairwater, Ely, um, a bit of Barry. So my father's brother, I won't name his name, but people in Cardiff know who he is. He had a hard life. He, he had defects, dyslexia, all that in school in the eighties. You know. No one knows what that is. He's just getting rinsed for it. You know what I mean? He's having yeah. a hard time. But yeah, yeah. You don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he don't know what's going on. <clears throat> and um, uh, in the obviously early nineties, late nineties, joy riding's a big thing. Smash and grabbing's a big thing. That's how you make your money. You know, um, there's no, um, there's no cameras. The police cars are crap. And so, um, him growing up, he he got into the wrong crowd. And uh, at the age of fifteen, he he ran over a girl, death by dangerous driving. Shit. And um. Yeah, it was all over like the papers, and my my my, my grandmother, the one who I used to look after, she had a hard time with that. Like, um, they they they, they said some bad things about her in the paper, which were not true. You know, like uh, the mother's an alcoholic, or my, my grandmother's not like she's a good good woman, yeah. like you know. Uh, my, my my and my granddad like worked all his life, very like um in the in the community, very looked up to man, like you know. So, um, th- you know that happened to him at fifteen, and 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 he had like a I think it was like a eleven year sentence, something. Where you had to do like three quarters of it, and it weren't like half. So I think he done eight years. He, well, it was fifteen. He came out when it, he, he went in at fifteen and came out at twenty one. No home release, nothing like that. And I know for a fact in there he was battered. He like six six of the years I think was solitary confinement. He was in Portland when it was like militarized style and stuff. And like I remember going up to see him in Portland and stuff. Like and he'd have black eyes and uh, my my family would be crying and. Yeah, like, the, like, I, but I kind of looked up to him in a way. Like, I, I didn't understand what happened. And at the, at the end of the day, like, I know it's such a terrible accident, but you know, um, it's not like he killed someone on purpose. It was an accident, and yeah. and, and road ac- accidents happen all the time, you know. And uh, you'd hear people like, especially when I was growing up in school. Like I said, I had a bad name in school. Like it stuck to me a bit. Like teachers would say, "Oh yeah, your uncle, kitty killer," like stuff. And these are teachers really? and din- yeah. dinner ladies and stuff. Like, like yeah, bad, yeah, oh, you're a mace. Like, well, that's like kind that. of pushing you in that direction. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. Like without them meaning to, but they are like mad. Like yeah, it's, it's, it, it, that's how it was. Like you know, and. Um, so, like, growing up, like, we used to go visit him in, and I, I, I visited him in Park, uh, Portland, and, and towards his release, Exeter. And this is when I'm starting to come of age now, 14, 15, and I, I've kind of come to terms of what's happened. Um, I'm hearing stories of, like, you know, he went driving and this and that. But at the end of the day, like, I looked up to him in a way. I don't know why. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's the, the product of the environment I'm in anyway, where, like, I'm on the estate. I've got to prove a name, you know. And uh, I looked up to him a lot. So um, at 15, 14, 15, he, was, he came out um, and then he went back in for like a, a, a not a death by dangerous, but he went into like a, a robbery. He did another four years. And then when he came out that time, he was due out. I was like 16, 17. I'm a man. I know like the streets, you know. The, yeah, you're the, getting you know, street wise, you know what's yeah, going on. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. And then at that age, you don't even like... Unless it's seriously a bad, like, wrong and offence. Like, anyone who's in jail, you're thinking, yeah, fair play. You know, it's just how it is. Glo- like, um, glorified, like, Glorify you, know, don't you? So, <clears throat> so there's that part of it. And then also, growing up, um, I'm with my friends. Um, uh, grime music came out. Um, obviously, you were listening in the ga- early, it was garage days, and then it turned to grime. And I remember seeing people like uh, Local and uh, the Foundation Crew, Let Loose Crew, uh, SP Mans. These are groups from Cardiff who started making music. And like, I was always listening to Wiley Kane on, on packs and, um, you know, yeah. crappy DVDs. And like, I'm now hearing 
people from my own area do it. And I'm like, what? That's possible. Thinking, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yo. And then we started to do our own little thing, like just as a group, like, and then, you know, the technology grew, so we had our little phones and stuff, so we do little videos, MCing and stuff. And one thing um, <coughs> for Fairwater, um, we're on the um, other side of Ely River, and um, obviously on the other side of that river is the name Ely, which is a big council estate in, yeah. in Cardiff. And Ely and Fairwater growing up always um, just never got on. You know that that uh, rivalry between two areas. You have Saint Mel Saint Melons, Lam Remney. Yeah, have, yeah, you know, all, yeah. You know the boys from that town. It's like, yeah, oh, you're yeah. gonna come here and steal my women. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was always doing that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. <clears throat> so obviously you had that, and then they had their like group of MCs, and we used to MC battle and stuff. So growing up, like um, this, all kind of set me onto this path of. This, I'm not saying it's bad because you know it's good. Like that was a, a great time of my life, but these things all kind of met up then so i had my good like friends who i used to chill with and um you know i'm lucky enough to say now now i'm back clean and i like they want to know me now as well which is a really good thing you know um i speak to them now more than i ever did um but uh a young i fell out with a, a close friend of mine over a girl which is pathetic i know but you know it happens it happens and it was my fault not him so yeah i was the scumbag <laughs> um and these all things came into play. So I fell out with my friends, stopped hanging around with them. I was, uh, hang, you know, I was hanging around with these boys. I was rapping. I was thinking I was this G. And then my uncle came out of prison. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to chill with him now. Like, you know, I started hanging around with him. And that kind of got me into this life of, uh, it opened up massively, like, to the things I've seen. So my uncle was a heroin addict as well. He he he, he actually got addicted to drugs in prison. Yeah. Um, and, and when he, as soon as he came out, like he, what you got to realize is like, yeah, like I said, he came out of 15, he went in at 15, came out at 21. He's big, you know, he, he, he's grown as a man, but he's still in his head. He was 15. So he was running around the first time he came out. Some of the stories I heard was crazy. Like, and I then when he, sorry. Yeah. I think, I think that age is like vital because I was hit with things at that age, which luckily I made some good decisions, but I, there were options <coughs> to be taken at the time where things could have been completely different for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people get tested with them things as well at that age. And we, like, it's I don't vital. know. Did you ever watch, like, kiddlehood, adulthood, all that yeah. sort of thing? That it's, shit, like, is, like, in my head, it's fucking awesome film, right? But it's, like, poison as well, because yeah. you're looking at that and you're thinking, fuck, I want to do that, like. Yeah, it's so enticing. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, um, and you had, if you, I don't know if you remember, do you remember Channel U? So you yeah. had like MTV Bass, you had MTV, MTV Bass, MTV Dance, MTV Hits, and you had The Box, Smash, Kiss, and then right at the top of the, if you if you had Sky, you'll remember, at, at the top of the channels, just after like The Vaults and like Smooth, you had Channel U. Right, okay. And Channel U was the UK stuff, you know? You had your Flirted D's, your Early Kano's, your, uh, it was just the, like, these are just, I think you like pay like um like a uh, fifty pound or a hundred pound to make your own hood video, send it on Channel U, and you're on Skylight. Do you know what I mean? So right? like you know, I'm looking at these people on these estates. I'm like, yo, this is kind of what we're doing, but like they're, they're on, on there, yeah, yeah, and it's like yo, like so these things growing up, like um like you say, like it, it entices you most definitely. Yeah, you know? like it changes your perspective on things. It takes away like if you're seeing people close to you as well, taking up these options as well, it's like peer pressure, isn't it? Yeah. Without even, they not, may not even be pushing it on you, but if you're just in around that circle, like you just start, you start thinking things are acceptable because you're there or you hear and people doing it. Like now I look back on some things and I think that's not acceptable. No. You know what I mean? And it's hard to hold yourself to that sort of standard when you're around it all the time because it's just normal. Yeah. And, an and another thing before we go on as well, um, <clears throat> I think when you're at that age as well, there's something in your brain. I don't know if it's the because um, the, the, the consequence and the attitude. I don't. I'm coming technical, but I'm not. I'm gonna sound idiot, like stupid saying this, but like this part of your brain, which at that age is 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 filled with the showing off, the attitude, the excitement, and the more like consequential side don't happen till you're older. And this is a worrying thing I've had with myself now because I started taking hard drugs 18, 19, so my my brain was still developing. So now I'm thinking to myself. Am I still that age in my head? No, I'm 29. Am I still that age? Yeah. And I worry sometimes, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's all good now. But, yeah, most it is. It's just one of them things, like, you know, which uh, you worry about. And 
yeah, like going back to like the the music then, like so, um, all this is happening at the time, and just be- like also, I got to say as well, which is bad because it's very relevant now to what's happening in these areas with the knife crime and stuff. But through the Ely Fairwater thing we done, uh, an actual friend of mine got stabbed, like he was yeah. really bad, and um, the the boy who done it went to prison and that, but he's come out turned his life around. I actually speak to the guy now, like I'm fair play to him, but we're all we're all genuine guys, but we would, like you know we're. We're not about that life, really. You'd probably be mates if you lived in a different place. Like, that's what's fucking mental about it all, isn't it? And it's all about the differences and the bigger picture. Like, you know, you say, like, if, 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 like, Swansea boys came down on a bus now, uh, them Ely boys who were fighting as Fairwater boys, we'd, uh, we'd stick together to fight them. But then if we were on holiday with them Swansea boys and we were getting jumped by English boys, we'd stick together. It's just and makes it's, no fucking no, no, sense, no, no. does it? And it's like what Dar- that was on the, ad- the the thing we done with Darren G the other day on the podcast, like he was saying the same thing about unity with football teams. and I, It's great because you like to feel that like rivalry. It is. It's, yeah. it's one of them things like, you know, um, it's part of the human brain, isn't it? It's back to the, like when we had tribes, yeah, isn't it? Like yeah. that's what it's all about. That's like, what it the, is, isn't it? Yeah, the Celts and like the Romans and whatever. It's all that. Yeah, just, yeah. Over and over again, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's just like when you look at the bigger picture now. Like, um, like the like I said, like the boy who stabbed my friend, and I like, you know, you know, he reg- you're just looking at him, you can tell he regrets it, and, and 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 now like he's living his life, he's killing life, like um, and 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 like you look back, you think ah, you just got to think of things, like you can't just react. But that's that, that that's kind of what it was growing up. It was so you had the, you know trying to this image of trying to act like this bad boy. When yeah. you're really not, because you're going home at night and you're worrying if your dad's going to come home, like, oh, you're ringing. You know, so I'm out in the day thinking I'm this bad boy, but really I'm a baby anyway. So, um, yeah, so then my uncle comes out of prison and I take myself away from my, my real friends because of what I'd done <laughs> with a girl, which is pathetic. Um, and then I'm looking at him now, like, and I mean, uh, this is the first time now, like, I've this got, he's been in prison all over the country. He's got, he's got connections from London to Birmingham. Manchester, Bristol. So, in his, I used to go and hang around in his flat, and um, I'm like, I'm really on the weed now. And the weed I used to take was to suppress my anxiety. It used to help at first, the weed, quite a lot. Uh, later on, it got to anxiety, which made me move on to heavier drugs. But um, I, like, you know, when I was when I used to hang around with my uncle, um, like, it was like the first time I ever seen crack, like a lump of crack, like the size of that on the table, heroin. Um, I've seen him like rob people stab people um i actually held a gun like I, i've had a gun in my hand he was shooting guns at pillows in his flat like just a nutter like yeah yeah, yeah yeah he was, he, like well luca knows it like he's like like he is nuts like and he still is to this day i love him to bits um i hope he changes his life like to be honest but i look back and i think can someone like you know my dad used to say to me it's all right for you to take you know it's all right for that. i understand if auntie's taking hardcore drugs look what he's been through but you like you, you've got a good family like what and and I look back now and I think you know you know if he this death by dangerous drive he done some people, and it's a big problem with drugs now. A lot of people just don't come off the drugs because they can't face reality of what they've done, or maybe they got on the drugs and then they done something bad. Now they won't come off the drugs because of what they've done. And I had a lot of that as well coming off the drugs because some of the things I'd done on drugs I couldn't face it. You know when I got off the drugs, the things that played through my mind when I like played it all through as a movie of what I've done in them years was horrific and I was bad for like two months. Mate, a wreck. I'm not surprised. Like to be honest with you, like I had a, I wouldn't call it a drink problem, but I had a problem when I was drinking. So probably yeah, <laughs> so probably yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, every yeah. weekend, I'd go out Friday, Saturday, Sunday, get pissed out my face, have a fight with someone, do something stupid, and then yeah, you look like one of them boys. Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Regret it then for the next four days and go do the same thing over and over again. But like you say, like until I like stop, I haven't drunk now for like maybe like a can in the last year or something. Yeah, well done, mate. Well done. Cheers. Cheers. It's it's not like. I'm not saying I'd never do it again, like, no, no, but yeah. I'm just not that keen to do it. And uh, I found, like, for a m- about, until about a month afterwards, like, all these emotions just yeah. started rushing in. And I'm like, like, panic attacks about things like, fucking, if I see so and so in the street, like, fuck, like, just all this little, little stupid things, shit. But it's like, that play yeah, a you, big part on your brain. You don't know who you are when you're in this cycle of just dumbing down your emotions, do you? And they don't oh. come through until a while after you've stopped, like, and it's like, Fucking hell. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just one of them things, like, you know, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I still get it now. Like, I still get it now. Like, um, even coming up here, I told you, didn't I? Like, um, I used to shoplift up 
everywhere and I'd done crick hole. I think I went to jail for some when when they got when they caught me for um, everything. The last prison sentence I'd done, they had me on watch from every um, from uh, from Hereford to West Wales, and they had me like a load of things on me, and um, they slammed me for the last one. I think one of them was up here, but like even driving up here just then, like it's like oh my god, I'm up here. what happens if I see that shop owner? What am, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, mate, I could imagine. It's, like, it's bad, uh, like you know, um, <laughs> you're making positive waves now, so I think like it, it's really hard, but you've got to detach yourself from that yeah. to a degree, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, you've got to, um, and, and like you said, that's what I'm trying to do now. So, yeah, so um, <clears throat> going back, like, so obviously, uh, I hang around with my uncle, he, he's just a nutter. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm doing my music, um, I'm not hanging around with my real friends, um, and my my mental health is through the roof. Um, I've now I'm now using weed to the to the point where um, my parents know it's it's not a secret no more. I'm smoking spliffs to go to bed out the back garden without them knowing, and and uh, it re- it really got bad when the one time I had to go for a job interview, and I had um, I had a job interview, and I had a, a bag full of CVs, and my dad said, "You're going to get this job." I come out of school, uh, year eleven, um, <clears throat> and um, he said, "You're going for this job. Um, you know, you're not hanging around the house no more." Um, uh, I remember being on Dole at the time, and they used to give you the little gyros like. And he, I was waiting for them every Wednesday, and I'd get in and spend it all on weed. And my dad said, "You're not doing this." Like so, um, I remember that I'm, I went down onto the bus stop to go to town, and I had my CVs on me, and I looked in my pocket, and I had half a spliff in my in my uh, in my pocket, and I thought, yeah. "Yes, I'll have this before I go on the bus." You know, wake and bake sort of thing. I never used to do that. I used to have one before bed, and I smoked it. And I remember getting on the bus, and then the next thing I remember was I was standing outside PC World like this. And someone looked at me when you were I, and I jumped back on the bus and I went home. My dad was like, "How did the job interview go?" And I never, I never dropped one CV off, and I never went to any of the, I never went to the interview, and I never dropped any CVs off. And that's when I thought, you know what, this weed is weird. I can't do this. I was that paranoid walking around town that every shop I went to, I went, "Oh no, they're looking at me," and I walked away. And then that's when I knew the weed was really bad for me, and it was messing up. Like the reason I started smoking weed was to suppress the anxiety. But now I'm smoking it and it's making me depressed. Um, and 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 then uh, it, it, it got like you know I was still I was still drinking alcohol. I'd sniff a bit of coke on the weekends with the boys because that's what it is where I am. It's just not a normal yeah. thing. <coughs> I think most areas in the UK is like that. You'd yeah. be surprised, mate. You go in the pub. I think ninety percent of the people in there are doing it. Of course, it. you know it's just one of them. Five percent of the people are the bar staff, like so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's the same as well. Like and, and like, I, like I'm not like um, uh, out in anyone. Like uh, this is this is fact there's a lot of people out there who sniff coke and smoke crack as well you know they, they well where i'm from cardiff is like like my my ex-partner's from bath and she came to cardiff and she said listen i've lived in london bristol bath and cardiff yeah and there's not a place like it cardiff where there's normal people who are crackheads like that's the way she used crackheads yeah, like, it's like it's normalized not, like it's yeah. normal it's mad i don't know why um but it's just it's, I think it's just because we're mad Welsh people who just love drugs and <laughs> love partying and stuff. What's it like then? Like, because you probably found yourself in some dodgy places, I'd imagine. Yeah. What's it like when you like wake up in like I don't know a crack den as such? Then uh, it's not a nice, not a nice feeling. Um, but at the time, like you know, uh, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. I look back now and I think, what was I doing? I woke up the one time in a place and um, I thought I used to right, I'd, right. So basically. Let me take it back then. Let me just, I'll, I'll weed yeah, it in, because yeah, right? obviously, yeah. so basically, I'm, I started, beca- I, I became a heroin addict, obviously, uh, this is where we're going. So, I started hanging around with these people who sold drugs, uh, sold heroin, sold crack, um, and they used to smoke it as well, in spliffs. And I'm looking at these people, I'm like, is that really, you're smoking gear? And the one time I, t- I tried crack, and the one of the, bo- I was like really pranging out, like, like, my anxiety was through the roof. My OCD, I was touching things. I was spinning around and all that. Because my OCD is bad. That's what I do with my OCD. I do weird things. And, and, and it just heightened it. And then someone said to me, oh, you have a puff of this? And I thought, no, it's a spliff. It'll make me worse. He went, no, it's lace with a bit of gear. So I ain't having that. He said, no, trust me. Listen, it'll can't, it'll take your anxiety away. And he went, you won't get addicted. Like, you know, it takes you like a... He said something like, it'll take you... 
uh, a week flat out to smoke it every day to get addicted. So I thought, oh, go on in. So I took it straight away. I just, everything went. I was just like so calm. And I thought, wow. And then I remember the next day, like, I was like, oh my God. I, I, I remember the next day, sorry. That's all right. The next day, I was like, oh my God, I've taken heroin. But it was fine. I was fine. I was like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not ill. I didn't know what it was like when they say addicted to heroin. I don't know if it was mental or physical, but I was like, I'm, I'm okay. But that was nice. And then from like you know, from, I, I I said on the pod on, on our podcast, I said like you know, it, it didn't get me from the moment like physically, but I was hooked from the straight away because from that moment I was like, I'm gonna do that again because it didn't get me addicted, so so I can do it again. So I think like so you playing know, tricks on you, playing like. tricks. So 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 um, at the time as well, I had a job and um, I was thinking, what I'll do is I'll have it every payday. As you do with other, you know, you buy clothes on your payday. Or yeah, yeah. Buy a pair of trainers on my payday. And that's it. Or <coughs> I would buy smack on my payday. Like, and that's how it started. And then it turned from every month to every two weeks, to every week, to every Monday and Saturday. And then I'll never forget the day I actually got addicted to it. I started smoking it on foil. Um, but I weren't... Y- I weren't your stereotypical heroin addict. Like, I had a place to stay so I could justify it there when people say, you know, like, yeah, I'm not on the streets. I had a job, yeah, so I was making my own money. Um, I, I dressed nice, yeah. Um, I brushed my teeth so my teeth weren't falling out. Um, th- there was all these things that I could try and justify it. Um, yeah. I weren't doing bad things. I don't look for, like him over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm fine, like, you know. Um, and then it it, it, it it just got like that, and then eventually um, I couldn't handle, I couldn't, I couldn't hold down a job anymore because I'd either spend all my money or I didn't have enough money for it, um, or sometimes I just didn't wake up for the job. And um, I did have jobs along the way, you know. Um, I've had some good jobs along the way. I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit later, like. But um, yeah, it was, it was. That's how I got uh, addicted to heroin, and I looked at it as well. Not just the, not just the. Uh, the visual side of like justifying it, it took away my OCD, it took away my ADHD, it took away my anxiety of worrying about people. I could stay over someone, I could stay over some chick's house. Like, like I didn't, like, at that time, like, you know, I didn't even think about my parents. I wasn't that constant worry. It's mad how it just flipped. I don't know if it was, but this is the mad thing. Maybe I was just growing up and I was a crybaby at 16 and at 18, you just grow up. But like in my head, I'm thinking, oh, the heroin's taking that away now. So, for you, it added an extra layer. For someone else, uh, yeah. yeah. For you, it's like you've got these other issues which you yeah. hadn't like dealt with in some shape or form, or found a way to cope with. Yeah. And that was just instant. So it was probably like an extra layer of addiction for you. Like it may yeah. take someone else a little while to get fully hooked, but for you, the impact it had was probably so great. I've got a, I have got a very big uh, addictive personality, and I, I've, I've come across a lot of people who have. And um, you know, like you say, uh, Luke is the same as well. Like if he does something, he's all in. You know, if. I don't know if he if he came across Pokemon cards. I think straight away, like you'll want to just start looking into Pokemon cards. Get obsessive like, uh, on things. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the same as me. Like, um, and uh, yeah, it, you know, that's how it started. So going back to like when you said some of the places I've been. Um, so I've been everywhere. Like, um, I, I I I was living up in like my my father tried doing everything. Um, like after two to three years of taking it, people on the streets are talking. They know I'm hanging around with certain certain characters. There's, they're telling my parents, they're telling my family, friends, they're telling my mates, and you know people are starting to see it. And and in those early days of addiction, um, they were my worst, as in what I was doing for that many. Um, so I used to like be a blagger. I don't say beggar because I never sat on a on a floor with a cup, but I was a blagger, and I used to go to places like Bath, Bristol, um, Newport, uh, Trafford Uni, Cardiff Uni. And I used to dress up. I used to have my my bag, uh, dressed like kind of like a student type of looking. Um, I used to I used to make fake uh, student cards, and um, I used to just go around these places pretending I was a, a a uni student who's lost his money and his phone. And um, I used to make like um, it's it's mad, but I used to like I, I remember one day I think I made like four hundred pound in a day just like people chucking me tenors or a fiver or and the best thing about it is like I learned like the uh, the the, the, the the fears. So when they'd be like, "Oh, so how much is it then?" Five, and I'd be like, "It's three pound nineteen. Like, <laughs> and that's a bit like so. Like, I blag it. Like, like I was like, I really took it serious. <laughs> yeah, put so much effort in. You could have had a good job. Like, yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. Oh, the amount of people who said, "Look at you. You could do. You could be a businessman. You can like. You could make loads of like. What are you doing? Like, and 
Um, but like some people would tell me, yo, you're doing sick. Why didn't you go to London? Why didn't you go to fucking Leicester Square? Like, you know, like the Romanians do, these like mad blaggers. Like, yeah. and, and and that was the worst time in my life because I remember um, I, I've done it a few times in Cardiff and people come across me, friends, family, and they could see what I was doing. Um, and uh, that was that was bad. So like my family kind of tried doing, trying to help me change my life. So my father... Um, he took me up to my nan's the one time up to Northampton, uh, my granny, when she moved up there. Because uh, that's where her family are from. They're from a little town called Corby in Northampton. She had Corby and Kettering. And Corby, they call it Little Scotland. It's basically a town in the middle of England, which is Scottish people. Yeah. So I think they moved in in like the 30s, this little Scottish town. It's a steelworks. And, you know, you go there and everything's iron brew, you know, the iron brew machines and Scottish bread. It's, everything's Scottish. It's it's a mad place, like, and then I, I moved there and um, I was there for the first five. I used to go there on holidays as a kid anyway, but I moved up there and the first five minutes I got there to go and do my detox, I met uh, um, someone, I'm like, yo, yo. Outside, they lived on a terrace, on a terrace, on like a terrace street. So they brought, they've came in, they've dropped the, the bags in. Like I've said hello to my nan. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to the shop. There's a co corner shop on the corner. As I've came out, I can see this guy. Now, when you're in that drug world, you know, you can identify someone who's on yeah, yeah. on drugs. Or you learn, see the signs like. Yeah, you see the signs. I'm going, yo, 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 what are you saying? He's like, all right, mate. I went, where, where can I get brandy from? Wait, brandy's heroin. Like, I see any, anyone who got any brandy or whiskey? He's like. Who are you, mate? He was like, "Who are you?" I was like, "Oh, mate." He's like, are "You were fed." This guy, he missed because I, because I, I still dressed smart. Like I didn't look like a, a smoker. He was like, well, "Who are you?" I went, "Oh, my nan lives here. I'm from Cardiff." I said, "I'm doing my detox. I'm doing my rattle life." Do you know what you mean? Come here, mate. He stepped me in the, in a in a in the doorway of like two doors down from my nan. He just opened up a pack like that of just shots, like like this. He was like the main dealer in Kettering Town. I'm like, "What's the chances?" Jack, like jackpot. I was thinking straight away. I had some money on me, bought my things. I went straight inside like that. So I'm, like, I'm inside. And I'm thinking, yes. I took his number. Uh, Soggy, his name was. I, I'll never forget his name. <laughs> Soggy. Last name Biscuit. Like, yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> you know, what a name, like, Soggy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then <laughs> so when I went inside then, and, and, and I'm like, I'll do anything for you now, Nan. I'll, I'll stay here. I'll stay here. I got my things now, innit? So now I'm thinking, yeah, I'll do my detox. I got my things. They don't know. Like, so my dad's like, you stay in here. You're not, you're not giving her an hour time. You don't go out the house. Da, 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 da. I'm like, okay, okay. So for the first three days I was ill, I was just shacked up. She thinks I'm doing my detox, but I'm in the bedroom, just flat out smoking for three days. When that got disappeared then, I started like, oh, man, can I go to the shop? Or can I walk into town? Because she thinks I've done my detox now for them three days. She thinks I'm okay. So every time I'm out now making money, shoplifting in these towns, blagging people, just meeting unsavory characters, she's coming home saying, oh, her family are ringing on and, and, and ringing my mum and dad. Yeah, he's doing really well. He's four days clean. Da, da, da. She I haven't got a clue. Um, and I, I, I was up there for about three months. And in them three months, I... I, I I must have slept with the whole town, all their missuses. Like I was really bad. <laughs> I was clubbing with like the normal people, but I was knowing all the unsavory characters as well. And um, they used to call me whales. <laughs> That's all you were. Yeah. Oi, whales. <laughs> Come here, mate. And um, uh, it got really bad. The one time I was up there, I was obviously a bit too big for my boots, thinking I, I was okay. I was young. I didn't have any... Uh, conscience or consequence on things because yeah, i was we, just flat out fueled with drugs and then um, i got jumped in a trap house uh so like when you talk about one of these places like this place right i'm not joking you go in the door and you, you know junk mail yeah it's just it's just everywhere junk mail everywhere the smell straight away is like oh, what is this place like you know you know you're going into a bad place you come from a good family but you're just you just won the drugs, like, and I went in this place, and in there, there was a kid on the floor, when dirty, nappy, and I, and there was two girls in here, and the one girl was uh, injecting base, injecting base into her toes, and I went, Can I, I'm not after base, I'm after heroin, crack, yeah, 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 no worries, no worries, no worries, and uh, I was there for about 10 minutes, and um, I was like, where's the guy then, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, and I didn't even know, like, I don't know why th this happened, and I don't know, like, I must have done something wrong, but when the, the, the guys came, they shut the door, one of them was in front of, and, and the next thing you know, I just get cracked like that, and I didn't know what happened, uh, I turned around and I'm just getting jumped, uh, they split my eye open and out, and, um, and then I left the house, 
And then as I'm as I was walking down the street, I couldn't really see nothing. People are like stopping, like you can see cars looking, you are right. And then the next thing you know, this woman pulled me and she was like, Are you okay? And I was like, Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. She was like, where, where, where do I go? I said, Oh, it's 85 Gladstone Street. That was my nan's house. So, and she took me there and she opened the door. And I like I look back now, my nan, like I feel sorry like for my nan because I've never heard my nan scream or anything, and she really screamed, what has happened? What's going on? What's going on? What, what's happened to you? And uh, they cleaned me up and whatever, and, and uh, my nan almost fucking had an heart attack, and I had to tell her I was back taking drugs. And I still think to this day, what did I do for these guys to jump me? But they battered me in this place. I must have upset them somehow. Um, obviously, I was um, I was like robbing certain dealers up there, and yeah. I was sleeping with certain people's misses. Now, maybe it was something like that. I don't know. We got around like... Yeah, yeah, because it's I, a small town. I, how do you, like, feel about that now? Because obviously I would imagine... How do you cope with, like, that guilt of, like, doing that to your nan and whatever? Yeah. Like, like more so, like, all that other shit. They're all in that world as well. But, like, when it's like, you say you're bringing it home, and you yeah, then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first time I brought something home as well. What you've got to realise as well, though, is um, it, uh, my nan is um, my uncle's... Um, Mum. Mum. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she's been there before. She knows the signs. That's why she took me up there to do my rattle. She thought, I'll get him sorted, sort of thing. She's old school, my nan. Um, and that's not in no cliche way. Like, she really is, like, and she's not daft. She had a lot of stuff with, with the papers and everything, uh, accusing her of stuff and, and just being horrible to her and my grandfather um, at that time. Um, and, and when my grandmother and my grandfather broke up in the early thousands, she went back up to her family. So... That was a haven for me. She, you know, I lived it as a kid with her, and then to see obviously me turn into that person, it must have broken her heart, like you know. So when she seen me like that, it was terrible. And she, she could have rung my dad then and said, "Listen, you know, he, he he's, he's blew it. He's been smoking drugs from the moment he's been here." But instead, she had me there for another month or two. And uh, uh, from that from that moment, she found out she was giving me money every day. Every day she was giving me 50 quid to go and score. Oh, I'll give you 50 this day, but tomorrow I'm going to give you 40 and we'll wean you off. Like, she's one of them, like, oh, we'll wean you off, don't worry. She's come up with a plan. She was, yeah, she come up with a proper plan, like, to get me off heroin. But it's, you know, it's, it's not the right way. You know, I'm, yeah, okay, well, I'll take two bags this day, and then the next day I'll take one, and and then the next day I'll just have half of that bag, and, and that's what I was doing with her. And I look back now, and I'm thinking, that's my nan. Like... I weren't stealing it from her, but I'm 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 causing her heartache. I'm taking her, her, her pension money, and it's just like wow, like um, just mad. Like and uh, then then the, I, the one morning, like she must have had enough of me. Like and she went, I'm ringing your father. That's a year done. I was like, yeah, whatever, man, whatever. And I went out to do my whatever I was doing. When I came back, my dad was in the house, so she was serious. I was like, what's going on? She was like, you're fucking coming home. You're coming home. Fucking t and this is my dad. I'm taking a piss out of my mother. What you want to? What you think you're gonna take the piss out? And even my uncle, who's nuts, and I was ringing me saying, "What you want to fucking rip the pit? You want to give my mother an heartache? Like I'll fucking kill you." That's what it was like, like, and I didn't realize like the heartache I was causing, you know. And then my uncle's around. I was like, "Shut up! Look at you, you rat!" But I think, wow, what was I doing? It's fucking bad. Like, and uh, for her to see me now the way I am is such a pleasure. Like, do you know what I mean it's such a nice feeling? But at then it was it was crazy. So then I came back um, to Cardiff. Years went on again doing mad stuff. And uh, like that one time I was in a house, like I, 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 I'll tell you. So basically I was in this house on um, Panath Road. It's on the back of the sit the old BMW Sitna. And there was a proper trap house, but it was for the city centre. So all the people who chill in the city centre of Cardiff, drug, drug users, would go back to this house. And um, you'd have all sorts in it. So I, when I took heroin, I never injected heroin. I always smoked it on foil. Hence why I went to a hospital with pneumonia because of my lungs. But um, there was a lot of people. With, there's a lot of needles everywhere. There's vitsy everywhere. There's spoons everywhere. There's wet wipes. It, it, it's it's just a horrible environment. And, yeah. you know, you've got to be careful where you're treading, like, because there are... That was what you could get, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the one time I, I, I stayed there, and I stayed on this little chair, like, and I was, like, sleeping. I woke up in the morning, and my whole body of this side was numb. My, uh, well, from my arm... I couldn't move my arm, and 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 for a, uh, it was like that for a month. And I thought someone injected me with something, because I don't know what happened. I don't. I still don't know what happened. Now, luckily, my arm just got better again. Maybe I just slept on it, dodge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dead uh, arm, like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was for a month. And my dad's like, "Listen, you've got something wrong. You're gonna get your arm's gonna get chopped off." Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'll have to show you some photos, mate. Uh, um, 
I used to always have scabs on my face. My whole body was covered in scabs. My legs were covered in scabs because of my OCD as well. When I was smoking, I used to pick and I was constant. Like, I was a mess. I think I've seen the one on the Wales Online and you look... You don't look like you. Now, no, the guy no. who's here today yeah. doesn't look like the guy in that photo. Like, yeah, well, that's mental. a good one. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, it, yeah. some really bad ones. Like, uh, I was like that. And, um, yeah, like, I, I oh, it, it is bad to look back at them, some of them. And, uh, like, like my dad said, like, you're going to, one of your legs are going to come off. One of your, you're going to get sepsis or something like that because you should have seen the, the scabs and then I'd be out then for like the next day, not resting, walking, hustling and it's sweating all these scabs and then in the, I wouldn't touch them and then they start to heal over. Then in the night I'd start smoking and I'd start picking them again and they just never heal and they got worse and worse. I got scars like on my body and our little ones like, but it was, it, it, you know, that, yeah. the, them early days of being on drugs was horrific uh, as in like, you know, trying to find, cause, cause I didn't want to come off the drugs. I was always trying to find a way I could always take this heroin and just live a comfortable life. I always wanted to have a car. I always wanted to have a wife. I always wanted to have a house, a job, but I still wanted to be on smack. Yeah, it's yeah, you smack. wanted it all, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd imagine a lot of people are in that boat, though, as well, aren't they? Because yeah. they probably don't see their lives going that way when they first take it. They just think, like, we'll have a bit of fun, yeah, but uh, my life's still over here, and then next thing you know, like, it's all unraveled, and it's like, fucking hell, I find myself... Yeah. I, bet, I bet them years flew by, did they? Yeah, they did. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's surreal uh, because I listen to certain songs at certain times of my life, and I look back and they're like eight years old, nine years old, and I'm like, what? It's mad. And all that time as well, I never ever went to jail during that time. I went to jail, um, like the second half of addiction, uh, and I like. Um, it's like when I look back, I think, oh, well, I used to black people, but I never got arrested for any of this. Like, because you, were, you might've got done for like, I don't know what, the, what the crime would be, but I never did. It was when I went into like shoplifting and stuff later on is like, like, that's how I went to jail for them type of things. But that time of my life, I was a real state. Um, I, 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 and it was a, it was a point in my life as well where, um, I, I, I didn't want people to know I was a druggie. I was, you know, it was still that stigma. Oh, you know, color mace, he takes heroin. He's a smackhead, or and I like I used to get offended by it. The second half of my life, I didn't care. Uh, I didn't really care. Like, but the first bit was a lot of heartache in that. Yeah, I would imagine so, mate. Yeah, it's like I could imagine. It's like embar. I expect you're embarrassed for you. I would imagine, like you, you know, people you know, like next thing you know, you've seen them and they're like they know. Then you got to maybe have an awkward conversation, or they, or they don't want to talk to you. Like I yeah, don't know. Did yeah. you have a lot of that? Or? I had a lot of that. Um, I've had I've had times where people have seen me in town and like they're like, yes, yeah, there's a couple of them like, yes, Cole, what's happening? Like, and I think they're being genuine, and then I'll clock one of them like, do you know what I mean? I'm like, you rat, like, do you know what I mean, yeah, I go, think I, go fuck yourself. I yeah. don't care. So like, it hurt though. I did care. <laughs> you did care. <laughs> I yeah. did oh, I care. Mate, of course you, you know, did. Like, you I couldn't go. In, I couldn't go in pubs and I. Not not because I was like go out with a pub. He was like, I ain't going in there. Like I know it's gonna be just all eyes and ears on the pa idiots, Paranoid like, about what they're yeah. saying about you. And, and where everything. I had such a nice life growing up and I was such a good kid and nice like I'd always get like uh, older women or, or older people like, Oh, it's such sad, like you were such a lovely boy and I'm like, Fuck it, I don't wanna hear this. I don't wanna hear this, like, you know. This is what I'm doing now. Don't fucking put me down. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Because and you were still justifying it to yourself, yeah, like you knew all yeah, the way along. Yeah. yeah, and it's like um, they're telling the truth, but you don't want to hear it. No, you don't want to hear it. Yeah, uh, and that's you know, and and that's the problem with a lot of addicts. You know, <laughs> you know, you you find anything to justify you. It's like I said, like um, I had I had a full time job, which um, in, you know, it entailed that I knew everything. I was never wrong. The pay was crap, and my holidays were to the hospital or prison. That was my job, like, you know, and um, it, it was a crap job. Yeah, <laughs> so know. prison for the first time, like, what was, what was that like? Because for, for you, for someone who didn't want to be away from home for a night yeah, as a yeah, youngster. Yeah, see, you then... know, you know, see. So um, it was 2012, 2013, so um, I met, I met, I met, um, this was like uh, yeah, this is my like second partner like uh, in my life like this is like my first girlfriend during addiction um she knew everything about me i, I thought honesty was the best policy in a relationship so you know she was going to know one way or another because my life is that crazy i might as well tell her listen i smoke heroin yeah I smoke, like i'm a i'm a drug user like you know and um 
she was a carer and she she left her job for me and I like she I I don't know if the I don't know if these girls who came into my life on drugs thought I'm gonna change him or they just love me for who I was I don't know which one it was because you get some girls who were like yeah, I'm gonna change him watch or you know they they like to make it a, a, a change a, a bad you know, boy or whatever like. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's for like themselves to think they're good or but I think it was like really like she just genuinely loved me and I say that because she ended up taking drugs as well. I know, ah, I right. know that's bad. Like, and and these are the things now. Which um, when I said getting clean now, these are the things I can live with. The fact that I got someone to take drugs, or the fact that um, friends growing up with me uh, took drugs with me. I never got them on drugs, but they took drugs with me, and they're still not off the, the drugs now. Well, they're in prison now, and it's like it kills me because I feel as well. How am I clean? Like, how? Why do I deserve to be sorted when they're not? Yeah, sort of you, you can't let that hold you back though. Not right now, because you're never. If if you, I imagine you know this, but if you hold on to that, you're gonna end up back there yourself. Yeah. Like, and I'm not saying now to be no, harsh no, or anything. No, you bang on me. Bang but on. you you you've got to like yeah remove yourself from that guilt in some shape or form or yeah. try to at least to be the person who can maybe help them because they're gonna look at you, they looked at you back then obviously found something about you they loved and whatever and thought that was a path for them as well. Yeah. Um, so now going forward, they still know you as that guy, I would imagine, somewhere deep inside themselves. Yeah, well, and they you, see your change. Yeah, they, well, do you know what? The, the good thing about it is this person I'm talking about, she's a lovely girl. She's now um, in a relationship. She's got two beautiful kids. And we actually talk from time to time. And it's nice, you know? Uh, I don't know what her family think about me. They probably hate me. And I don't blame them. I don't blame you. But... Um, she t still talks to me and I think, you know what, fair play to you, fair play. Um, so, yeah, so basically I met this girl, she quit a job for me and this is where the shoplifting came into the frame because she had a car and now I can I can leave Cardiff, I can hit shops, um, it's easy money for me um, and, yeah, so that's kind of what happened at the start. Um, I started going all these places, that's how I started to make my money and, and, and that's what I'd done as a, profession when i was on on uh drugs we ain't good at it because i got caught so many times but um so yeah so i uh I, I'll, I'll never forget my first time going inside um so i was on 90 mil of methadone uh on a methadone script and in wales at the time if you're on a methadone script and you miss three days um so i was on a, something called a drr order so on the before going up to pr before going to prison I had all my uh, strike one, strike two, strike three. So I had my suspended sentences. I had my tags. I had my community services. And then when it came to the last and it was like, no, mate, no more chances. You know, yeah. you're, you're done. Next time you're going to jail. <laughs> and um, I went a, I went to a dip where I got my uh, my methadone script. And um, one of the uh, drug you uh, one of the service users, uh, uh, one of the service services, people who work in the services, sorry, sorry um, said, um, Colin, you know you're wanted in it for another shoplift, and I was on a suspend. I was on two. I was on two suspend. No, I was on one suspended sentence. Sorry, um, I had a tag brace on. There was no more. You know, next time you're done, and they went, Colin, you know you're wanted for another shoplift, and I was like, oh, man. couldn't believe it. I was like, okay, no worries. So what's going to happen here? And they said you can have to hand yourself in. I was like, I'm not doing that. So what did I do? Um, obviously, I didn't want to go to prison, especially for my first time. I um, had took my. I, I sat. I, they gave me my methadone. I drank it, left. Then, I thought I'm gonna have to go on the run. I'm not going to prison, but I'm on a methadone script. And if you miss three days, they kick you off it. So, um, I ended up uh, shoplifting even more to get more money for heroin to now subsidise my heroin addiction and my methadone addiction because I'm on two habits. So I need to cover for the methadone. And um, it was the worst thing I'd done. If I just handed myself in, I would have stayed on the methadone script in there and things would have been a lot easier for my first jail sentence, basically. Yeah. So uh, long story short, I got caught. I went into prison. Um, I never had no heroin on me, you know, uh, no drugs on me to take with me. Um, I was just caught off-road, off-guard. And... Um, yeah, so I went in and I've gone in there. I said, uh, I didn't, you know, I was like, can I get, can I get any methadone? I'm clucking, like, you know, can I get anything to help me? Any, and, and they, and, and Wales is the worst for it. They've started to like uh, 
Can you a bit more lenient now? And I think they're giving it. But at the time, they were ruthless. And they were like, no, you missed three days. You, you're done. You're not You're not going on it. So for the first <coughs> the first two weeks of being in, in Cardiff prison, um, I was on the drug wing. But everyone around me on the drug wing was on their methadone, all cosy and, you know, just living their lives yeah. as they would. And I was doing a, a heroin rattle and a 90 mil methadone rattle. And when you're in prison, um, they, you'll have your breakfast. Uh, they off, at the time, they used to throw your milks at the door and your breakfast pack. Now they do it at the night time for the morning. But at the time, they do that. So they'd throw these things at your door. I'll never forget it, right? Because it was my first ever time in. And I heard a slap on the door and I was rattling and my mouth was dry and I didn't know where I was. And... Um, I said to my pam, I said, what's that? He went, that's the milk boy. Yeah, you've got a milk boy. Some mad taffy. <laughs> Gavin, I'll, I've never forget him. He's like, that's our milk boy. I was like, yes, I've got a dry mouth. I need a drink. So they opened it. I didn't even look at it. I just ripped it open. I started necking it. I was like, <laughs> I spat it. I was like, what? I said, what the fuck was that? He was like, welcome to jail, boy. It was like, like THC one, which like, uh, like boil it for like a year or two. And it's oh, like, fuck, it yeah. tasted rank. It tasted like... Um, UHT or whatever is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. I thought, I'm gonna, I like my milk. I, I, I like a pint of milk. I was thinking, yeah, get that down me. It was cold. It was like tasting piss. And uh, he was like, welcome to jail, boy. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm really here. I and then, that's fucking mental. Yeah, like, yeah, it? yeah. And then, and then, like, obviously, um, where I like, where I couldn't really get off the bed, I was spewing, I was shitting, um, I was constantly just, I couldn't move. And um, in the mornings, and your doors are open, and then everyone's allowed to just float around. So I'm in jail for the first time ever. And if any drama is gonna happen or any robberies, it normally happens in the morning. You know, when everyone opens their doors, get up early. You know, in the cell straight away, like, yeah. and like, my door's just open, and I'm just doing my rat. Like, people are coming in. What's happening, bro? Oh, oh, what are you in for? I'm just like, get away. Like, I wait. I didn't even like. I didn't even know what I was. So, and it was lucky because my uncle, as well, like, as he, he's quite well known in the prison system. So, Mace, like my surname, people were coming. Well, you're Mace. Oh, you're not Anthony. So I was a bit lucky. And then <clears throat> they put me over to F Wing in Cardiff. And uh, I seen a, a, a close friend of mine who I grew up with in school, Khalid Topper. Shout out to Khalid. And um, <clears throat> I didn't, I couldn't believe he was in there. I was like, what's happening? What are you in for? And he was telling me whatever. I said, should we get toed up? So we got toed up. And I was still ill, really bad. But I was starting to like, I was on F Wing. It was more stuff happening. Like again, like subbies to sniff and stuff like that. So it was a bit better. I was getting on my feet a bit. Um, but it was it was like F wing's a big wing and like you're like whoa I'm in the prison system now because the D wing was more of a, a drug wing and it's more calm and quiet people just want to get their head down like sort of thing so we got to up we were there for a day right I thought I could do this like you know I, I could do this like it's not a bad like I got my make do with that I get a subby if I hustle it and so in the morning I wake up I'm like ah oh, let's, all right let's see what this sentence is gonna bring me you know. Boom, through the door, a yellow slip come through the door. I said, you f you fit the criteria. You fit um, the criteria of an overcrowded prisoner. HMP, Birmingham. I was like, what? Callie's like, bro, you're going to Birmingham. I said, what? He said, yeah, you're going to Birmingham. I was like, Birmingham? Well, Winston Green, prison. The sc I went to him and go, listen, I, I, this is a, must be a mistake. Like, I'm in for a shoplift. Like, um, and you know, it's my first time. Uh, can I stay in my local prison? They were like, no, you got to go. Like, fuck it now. And then everyone's like, oh, the matey, you're going to Winston Green, mate. Like, and this, and, 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 I, and this was just before the riot in Birmingham as well, uh, the prison riot. It, I was just like, oh my God, this, is, this can't be happening to me. So we went in the meat wagon up there and they put me on. When we first went in, it's a mad prison, massive as well. And when you were pulling in it, and it was like bullet holes in the window. Window. You know, like when you go into the gate, like yeah. it's in it's in Handsworth, I think, isn't it? And when you or Winston Green, and when you go into the the doorway, you got these two blue arches with windows, and it was bullet holes in the wind. And the, this mad taffy who was in it because obviously it was it was like five of us who went in from Cardiff as overcrowded prisoners. He was like fucking hell, boy, look at the bullet holes. <laughs> like <laughs> it was mad. Like was Ross like, Kemp on gangs, bloke, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, the milk, like yeah. yeah. I was like, ah, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. There was a kid in here as well, Levi. Uh, he, he's been through the system. He knew my uncle and Annie. He was like, yeah, this is a, this is a naughty JLS, bro. Naughty. Nothing like Cardiff. And Cardiff was quite like bad to me because it was my first time in. And I'm like seeing people get beat up. The, the bells were going off every day. I'm like, fucking worse in Cardiff. Nah, like, do you know what I mean? Went in there. I seen Fred West's cell where he hung himself. Um, really, yeah. yeah, it's on induction it's wing. So uh, induction's like a very old bit as well. And it was a bolted door. And I was like, Gov, what's that door for? He was like, oh, that's Fred West's cell. It was mad. Like, the histories in jails is crazy. Because Cardiff and Birmingham, they're like Victorian prisons. Um, Birmingham got a, a, a new side now. So 
this is what happened. So obviously I was I I I weren't allowed on the methadone script in Wales, but now I'm in England and uh, Levi, who, who, who I was speaking to on the way up in the meat wagon, he was like, "Why well, you're doing your rattly?" I was like, "Yeah, I'm fucked," because methadone and he heroin. If you do a detox on heroin, it could take you four or five days, and you start to get on your feet. Methadone stays in your system for months. Really? It's, it's a really hard that. rattle to do. So I was coming off the heroin and the meth and um, I was still no energy. I couldn't really stand and I'm going to Birmingham like and I'm going to get robbed probably because you've got your smokers packs. Yeah, I haven't really smoked anything because I'm out, out of it like and uh, I've got two pairs of trainers. i got nice clothes and I'm thinking I'm going to get jacked up here now because I can't even fend for myself. So when I went up here, he goes, you know, they get you on the meth up here. You're in an English jail. So when I went up there, I went straight to him. I said, can I go on meth? They were like, yeah, you can go on a meth, but you'll be on a drug wing. So I remembered the drug wing from Cardiff. I thought, well, it was quite calm. Eh? I could just do my time here. Bugger it. I heard it's a rough place, but worst mistake of my life. So um, I'm on the induction wing now, and it's like local Birmingham lads in here, people coming in for murder charges, and I'm like, wow, this ain't me. Like, I ain't this guy. <laughs> and... Um, I'll never forget it. They give me my meth and then they called me the next day and they were like, Mace, B-Wing. And this is the old side of, of Birmingham, not the new side. They were like, Mace, B-Wing. And I seen this young boy who looked like he was about that life from Birmingham. He was like, oh, lad, you're going Beirut, you are. I said, what? He went B-Wing. Yeah, Beirut wing. It's the worst wing in the jail. I was like, oh my God. So they let me in there and it was like A-Wing on Cardiff and F-Wing, a big wings, yeah. Um, like, you know, it's like, I think 500 prisoners. That's well, this. Wild. Well, this B wing in 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 Winston Green was A wing or F wing in Cardiff twice, so it would go like the length, and then there'd be a pool table, that, and it'd be it again. It was like a thousand prisoners on this wing, and they'd come on the wing like, and just eyes all on me, staring at me, and I'm just like, oh, people coming up to you straight away. Oh, yo, got anything? You got anything? And I and I I was just like. Mate, this ain't me. Like, I went straight to the set to the ghost cell. I went, Can you get me off? You're hitting, you're like, No, nah, you're fucking cell full on the twos. And I'm like, I broke down. I, 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 I asked to use a the phone. They give me my pin code, which I didn't even know how to use at the time. And I rang my dad and I cried. I'm not even lying. Like, I don't care what anyone says. Like, if people say jail's easy, they're lying to you, mate. I'm telling you. I cried. As soon as I heard my dad's a voice, I said, Dad, I'm in Birmingham. He said, You what? I said, I'm in fucking Birmingham, Dad. He was like, right, I'm going to get all the Declan. Declan's my solicitor. Declan and John Lewis, they're gangsters, fair play to him. Been here from, from day one with me. But, right, I'm going to ring Declan. I was like, oh, what are they going to do? He went, I don't know, but I'll try and sort something out. So that, that was that. So I went into this cell with this guy from Stoke. People were trying it on with me up there. You could, They probably could tell I was a, you know, I was a big boy, but I was skinny at the time because of drugs. But... They, you know, probably they could tell I was a new prisoner because I didn't really know the, the stuff. And then I will never forget there was this boy Pricey in here, and he was a traveller from Wolverhampton. He was a yam yam, and he went. Uh, they always say to me, they always used to think I look like a traveller in there. This is every time I go to jail, like I get travellers like trying to talk to me, like I'm some yeah. yeah. And he goes, "Yo, yo, brother, uh, what family are you?" And I goes, "The Maces." He <laughs> like the Mace. Like I'm thinking, like he thinks I'm a Jones or a, I don't know, um, a dress scholar. Or he yeah. thinks I'm some traveller. He's like, "What family are you then, mate?" I went, uh, "The Maces." Do you know him? Like he's like, "Yeah, okay, where are you from?" I said, "Wales." And I'm fair play to him. I'll never forget him. He he showed me so much respect up there. He went, so you're from Wales, you? And he started naming families from 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 Cardiff, who I knew of. So I tell him, and he was like, he took a liking to me and fair play. You could tell some of like, you know, the the, the, the black boys at Birmingham, the Asian, they took, they was quite scared of this pricey kid. And uh, he took me under his wing, fair play. And he, he, go, he got me into my cell and that, and I was in with this weird Stoke lad and, he goes to me, uh, oh, do you want to meet your other mates? And I went, what do you mean? He went, you're other Welsh boys. I was like, what, there's others on you? He went, yeah, come with me. <laughs> uh, and and, and uh, in Winston Green, there's five landings, not four. It's massive. It's it's massive, yeah? And uh, uh, it was amazing. It was mad. So he, he took me up to this stair like that. There's people like outside doors. It's, it's mad a bit. It's, it's like... It's like a tower... You know, like um, a tower block on an estate, like with yeah. the balcony. It was just like that, like just... So things happening yeah, yeah there was a yeah. fight on there the one time I, i'll go back to this now but there was a fight on there the one time right and one of the boys was just pissing on the other lad down there when they were fighting the screws right this big fat big fat screw come on like after the damage is done right bang up boys just like don't give a shit they just don't give a fuck up you i thought you would get up. you would get murked up here do you know what i mean you're gonna like if some if someone wanted to kill you up here you're getting killed end of like it's that serious up there then yeah them english jails they don't mess about i swear to god it's mad doing it because yeah you you like to think like 
there's people on every corner in case something goes off or whatever versus it, obviously oh, not the case. Mate, like. it's nuts, mate. Yeah, it is nuts. So, um, yeah, so they take me up to, so I'm walking past all these characters, like, you know, the, the guy with a matchstick staring at me and I like, and um, they opened this door and I'll never forget it like that, right? It was like walking back into Cardiff prison. Like, just like, Ah, what's happening, bad? Oh, you know, you know, like, like, and you could t- you could tell how Welsh she was as well, because like you could just hear like the Welsh the Welshness of yeah. like. But did that feel like a bit of like home oh, for you then? Mate, trust me, trust me, it was amazing. There was two Swansea boys, one Lanethley boy, one from Ember Vale, uh, and one from Newport. I was the only Cardiff boy, so they were like Cardiff, what's happening, bad? <laughs> but they but they had love up there. Everyone loved them up there, like. Um, you know, like when you, you know, you'd see other guys, like when they shut the door to start speaking to me, there was English boys coming in, what's happening? You're like, oh yeah, two sex. Like, but it was like, I felt like cozy and all that. And I'll never forget it. They shut the door. He went, listen, Cullen, listen, mate, you'll see things in this jail that you'll never see anywhere else. I'm like, oh, what do you mean? They were like, fucking someone fucking hung themselves last night. Someone got cut up the other day. Like, And it was this Swansea boy sat on a fucking... Drain, he's like, yeah, but I've been here four months. There's been ten deaths already. But they don't tell you this in the news, and I like, do you know what I mean? None of these things. But That's fucking mad. Yeah, and like, yeah, and like, the, you, the, the, I can't remember his name. There was a kid called Jenkins. He's just mad from uh, Lan Eflin. You had, you had Parfit from Ebervale. But they were like, listen, mate, I could tell you're a new boy, but you'll be all right. He's like, but you'll see things in this jail you'll never see anywhere else. Anyway, um, crazy man. Yeah. Bet, like, that's yeah. Oh, and you do like li- listen, like, um, I, 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 like when I was up there, I was only up there for. a let me just finish off, like, so the next day, um, I guess I goes back up there, I thought I'll start hanging around with these guys now, innit? They, and all is this, Mace, shipment, I'm like, I can't get a fucking break here, do you know what I mean? I can't get a break, I'm starting to meet these guys now, and I said, where am I going? He went, Stokey, and all you can hear then is everyone on the wing, ooh, Stokey, oh, no, no, I'm like, as if that's even worse than Birmingham. <laughs> I'm like, nothing can be worse than this. Yeah. But they were joking because, do you know what? Stokey was the best prison I went to. Out of even, like, from Car- like my like it's nice to be in your local prison, but Stokey was the best jail, especially them times. It got a bit rough after, I heard. But um, it was the best thing I ever done. Um, and it was kind of similar up there as well. So they put me up to Stokey then from Birmingham. And that's in Shropshire. And apparently it's a local jail for Welsh people because it's um, near North Wales. So when I've gone up there, the officer, Mr. Malpas, I'll never forget him, he was like, oh, another Welsh boy. I said, what, Welsh boy? What do you mean? He went, oh, well, yeah, there's loads of Welsh up here. I was like, oh, Bersi and I might know people up here then, innit? Like, and um, when I got there, I found out they were North Walians and they speak oh, Welsh and they, and they fucking hated us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like fucking rivalries again, innit? Yeah, between like... It, Two Welsh towns, like whatever. Yeah, exactly. It's not even like there was unity between us, like, because the Welsh. And do you know the maddest thing about it is, like, we sound Welsh. Yeah, we sound Welsh, don't we? Do you know what I mean? The the, the twang of South Wales and the valleys, yeah. Yeah, But we haven't got a fucking one word. We The only words I know in Welsh are rude words. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know. But then you go up there and they sound like Scousers. They sound English and they know. They That's their Welsh. language, yeah. I know, it's mental, mate. I it couldn't string mad. a sentence together, like, do you know what I mean? You fucking it's, think- it's mad. It's mad. But that was my first time, and, I, and, and, and my first time, because I had the suspended sentence, they gave me 10 months for shoplifting. Everyone was like, what? Like, people get, like, a month, like, four weeks, yeah. eight weeks to four then, for shoplifting. And then getting moved around as well. Like, yeah. did, did, did that, like, benefit you in any way going to prison, do you think? No. Not at all. And that's, like, got, like, you know, scared me uh, the first time, second time. Every time, really, I didn't want to go there. I fucking hated the place because I like to have my own comforts, you know. Um, I like, you know, <laughs> the, the jail is not a place for anyone, I think. Like, okay, you know, some people do terrible things and maybe, you know, if it's on a, on a, on a wrong level, maybe you should have the fucking death penalty, maybe. Because, you know, I just don't think jail rehabilitates people. You know, uh, like, for, and I, I mean that, I swear to God. You go in there and you learn a better way to get away with it or you know come out come out just educated on how to do more crime and as well like I think if what people they want to do is like yeah they should put people in for like a week or two to scare them so they don't find their feet and then take them out when they're in there for like you know a year or two and they think it's comfortable that's when they come out and say yeah jail's easy man yeah, I can't I'll do that on my toilet yeah because there's there's no punishment there it is yeah, you know, they're they're around their mates as yeah, such. Then, yeah. mate, I could imagine it's like 
the first day you step into your new job, you're like fucking nervous as fuck. Nervous. And then after like two weeks, you got to know everyone and you start slacking off. Yeah, you? It exactly. becomes easy. And you, like, find, you find your comfort in it, you know? Um, like, I never did like it, but I, I made the most of it when I was there. Education, I made the most of. Uh, music, I made the most of. Um, and just, yeah, you know, finding myself as well. A lot of my growing up, believe it or not, happened in, in prison. Yeah, I, I got to be fair, it did, yeah. But it never stopped me from going back. Like, like, and that's my argument for addiction anyway. I don't think, I think if you're, if you're an addict, I think prison ain't for you. If, if you've done something due to addiction, I don't believe that prison is the way. And, and, and people will disagree with me, and I totally understand that. And, it's, um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of small mind. It sounds cheeky me saying it, but there's small-minded people out there who just think, yeah, I get him in, he's a, he's a, he's a janky, get him in. No, they deserve, they deserve uh, help, and it's an illness at the end of the day, I think. And but They're doing these things to support their habit, aren't they? They met, like... Unless they were de weren't desperate, they wouldn't be doing these things, would they? It is literally out of pure desperation that they're finding themselves yeah. in the position. I know they've put themselves in that position some shape or form, yeah. but they never thought it was going to spiral or lead to that point, I wouldn't yeah. imagine. Innit? But I don't blame drug dealers either, you know? You know, it's not like you might think I could be very envious and be like, you know, fuck drug dealers, they ruined my life. Some of, some of the drug dealers I met were, like, really nice, and some of them still speak to me this day and say, do you know what, I'm so glad you've turned your life around, like... You, even when I was on drugs, Cullen, man, I don't want to be giving you this. Like, okay, they might not have that relationship with someone else who they sell to, but there's a lot of people. Like, if they're not going to do it, someone else is, you know? Yeah. And it's the same as, um, uh, I remember, like, in, like, 2010 to 2012, my dad used to do the personal injury claims, and people would be like, oh, back in ambulance chaser, trying to, you know, get claims for people. Oh, well, if he don't, someone else will. Like, it's just one of them things. How Supply we survive. and demand, isn't it? Like, exactly. Yeah. Like, and, 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 that's, and that's, that, that's, that's how it is in any, any aspect of life. Um, you know, I don't blame anyone for me being on drugs. I don't blame anyone. I knew what heroin and crack was in primary school. You know, um, it's my fault. Um, deal with it. T it takes a man to own up to that as well, I think. And that's the only reason you're probably in the position you are right now where you're not taking it. And yeah. How, how long clean are you now, Cullen? Um, I'm 10, 10 months. Yeah, 10 months. congratulations, uh, nearly, mate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank amazing, you. mate. This is the longest. Like, even in prison when I was clean, I was on a methadone script maybe or... This is the first time, and I don't count count that as clean anyway, because you, you, the temptation. All right, it is drugs in jail, but the temptation isn't there like it is on road, and I always had that. Oh, when I get out, just have one more hit. I'll, I'll just have that one smoke on. You know, the, the forty seven pound they give you to really be released with. I buy two bags of that, and that's me done. Then I'll never take drugs again. But it never works. No. Um, so, so, so yeah. how have you found yourself in this position now, clean? Like, what was the <coughs> so um, the factor? There's a couple of factors. Um, obviously, over the years now, um, on addiction, uh, I started to like make a lot of money off the shoplifting. Um, used to go certain places, and I was quite reckless with it. And I, I met people along the way, um, and I met a friend. Uh, I, I do class him as a friend. You know, a lot of people in that in that world are acquaintances, or just you just use them for your addiction yeah. needs. This person was a real friend of mine. Um, I knew him before, kind of. Uh, got to really know him th through my hard times and his hard times. Um, we were partners in crime as well. Cody's, being in jail together, being nicked together, being rammed off the road together <laughs> by <laughs> police. And, yeah. But I knew his family very well and he knew my family and, and, and it was like that. And uh, last year, um, he passed away. Um, that, yeah, this call. Cool. Um, he passed away, and 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 as mad as it sounds, the very next day he passed. Um, when I found out about it, my kind of body went into some mad sh shutdown mode. So just before it happened, like like to the turn of twenty twenty, um, twenty nineteen, twenty twenty, like I could feel my body changing. <laughs> I didn't you probably hear it now, like, but my my breathing's fucked, and um. I, I just knew it was a time for a change. Um, I'm big with numbers as well with my OCD and stuff, and I always thought I was going to pass away at 28. And um, when I when I went to... Ho um, so he passed away. The very next day, I started feeling all weird, and I went to hospital because I had pains in my back. They sent me straight up to Landock Hospital. They'd done some checks. They said, you are, take these antibiotics, and sent me on my way. Uh, that night, I woke up at like 3 in the morning in a real hot sweat, 
just really like don't know what was happening i sat up as soon as i sat up i started feeling stabbing pains and <gasps> catching and i couldn't breathe or nothing um so uh i was at my parents at the time on tag and um, this is again like all it all come into play like it all come to a head stop so i was on a, i was on tag i had community service again i was on like another last chance saloon sort of thing my mate just passed I've started feeling this bad thing. I've ended up fucking passing out, passed out, and um, I woke up in Heath Hospital with uh, two two drips on each arm. Um, people saying um, you got sepsis, you got pneumonia. Um, we don't know if you're gonna make it or not. And uh, and then I was coming off because uh, I was on a methadone script in there as well. Uh, I was coming off, he- so I was coming off heroin, methadone, and I had sepsis, pneumonia, and caught COVID in there as well. Fucking hell. So uh, yeah, I was fucked. <laughs> I'm not Basically, surprised me. That like, sounds like, fucking yeah, like brutal. I was, I was really bad. And the maddest thing is, like I was always said, I'm gonna die. Twenty eight, twenty eight. It always, it was just one of them things in my head. And I went in on July the the last ne- day of July, and my birthday's August the eighth. So I'm twenty eight inside, thinking, oh my god. I'm I'm gonna die. I'm 28. So you fucking it, manifested it's gonna, it yourself. Gonna, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I said, I, I just, I prayed to whoever was up there, you know, and said, um, just please let me get through this. I will, you know, I'll never take drugs again, and 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 I'll help anyone I can from here. Like, um, so like you know when they say the penny drops or people's have their rock bottom. Jail was never my rock bottom. This was my rock bottom, and from then on, I got, um, I have, I started fighting it. And um, I was on antibiotics and I was in there for four, three weeks. And even when I got out, um, I was on antibiotics for a month. And then eventually um, I just, I made that, that that deal with myself that I'll never take it again. Um, when I was in hospital, sorry, um, they said to me, you can stay on your methadone script, but you have to come in every day to pick it up, even weekends. So that means then I have no life. I have no life anyway, because I'm on methadone, but can't go on holiday or nothing. I'm on probation, I'm on tag. I thought if I'm ever going to change, it's got to be now. You've just made this bargain. If you pull through this, you'll never do it. So just, you know, and they said, uh, you can either stay on your script or we can offer you this uh, injection, which is called Bouvadal. Now, uh, Bouvadal is a opiate blocker. So um, if they stick it in you and you try taking heroin, it wouldn't do nothing. Really? If, yeah. Fucking hell. Yeah. So if you snapped your leg and they tried dosing you with morphine, it wouldn't do All nothing. All right. So yeah, you could yeah. plus points and... Negative yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. So I just said, you know what, give it to me. Um, and it was massive. It's still big in Australia and Sweden. Um, I was one of the first test runs in, in, in Britain, and I've never looked back. Mate, amazing. Yeah. So it was obviously working, it's, like, yeah. Yeah, but I, like, I, I try and stress to people, it's not a silver bullet. Like, it's not like, get every heroin user in Britain and give them this, because there's factors to it. Like, you've got to be ready to come off. Um, you've got to have people around you. Like, think about it now, yeah. So I... I was a big, um, these people who have had it as well and it haven't worked out too well for them for the simple reason. They, they've they tackled their heroin addiction, but they're smoking crack or spice 10 times as much now because they got that to change. Their mind's not ready. like Their yeah. mind's not ready. like um, and, and with the crack with me, I only took crack to have a buzz and then come down because the crack um, would mess with my OCD. Um, so as soon as I tackled the opiate one, everything else stopped. Do you know what I mean? Um, and there's people out there as well who might want to change, but they're on the streets. They're on the streets. They've gone now. When the only people they got are, are the addicts, and now you've got an injection, and you're on the street sober now, and you're, you're, you're sleeping on the street sober. Everyone else around you in your circle are taking drugs. Um, you can't sleep at night. You're cold. There's so many factors to it. These people got to be. They got to have a place to stay. They've got to have. Um, you know, guidance. They've got to have, um, you know, d- yeah, these just factors a support to it. network around and, you and as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is why I think m- it worked so well for me because at the time I had a, a girl who was there for me the whole way. Amazing. My parents are still there. My family, my friends are back. Um, there was so many factors, you know. So, like, if it was on a pie chart, it would be like, you know, my health, my friend dying, my family, and then just me myself with my will to change as well. Mate, if you if you didn't make that promise and keep it, like you know, if you'd said you you come out of there on that methadone script or whatever, if you didn't keep that promise, it's like you've got to find something to be proud of yourself for as well, haven't you? You've got to be happy with what you're doing, and it's like forming habits one way or another. If you if you just keep doing bad things and lying to yourself about coming off it, 
like you're reinforcing that, aren't you? Yeah. Like you, you're reinforcing the fact that you you're allowed to let yourself down all the time. Exactly. Exactly. Whereas like you you now I feel like I can do that, and yeah. I even now to like to this day, like now, like I'm. Um, I have good things going for me and I think, nah, something bad's going to happen. Like, I always doubt myself or I'm all, always expecting that bad thing to happen because for 10 years, it, it did. And um, it's just a shock now to see that the things I'm doing well is is, is helping, like, you know? Yeah. So, I, I've got sorry. mad respect for what you're doing now as well. Like, you're obviously turning things around and uh, I'd love for you to talk on that a bit about what you're doing now. Yeah, okay. So, um, sorry, let me just have a drink of this. It's all good, mate. Dr- fill the waters up. <laughs> <laughs> Dry, yeah, you said. There's gold, man, Luca. He's like my little brother. Now you're obviously surrounding yourself with good people. Yeah, that's as well, that's that's I mean. big. That's big. Trust me. Um, so right, so when I got clean, um, before I got clean, I always wanted to work with, you know, when I was in prison and um, the drug people used to come to my cell door and they'd be like, "What are you doing, mate?" And you can tell some of these people have been there before, and I'm like. They've turned their lives around. And I'm thinking, do you know what? I'd love to do that. And people always used to say to me, Cullen, you'll never leave this game. You love it too much. You love the streets. You love the the lingo. You love the excitement of what's going on. And they're right. They they are right in a way. And I will never leave this game now, but it will be for the good. It won't be for drug taking. It'll now be for helping other people. Um, So when I got clean, I, I started to research these places that do uh voluntary voluntary work and um i was doing i was lucky because the voluntary class the zoom calls so i was just sat doing zoom calls all the time um i reached out to the other agencies and you know just 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 the things i never would have done before i done i always thought that these like recovery places were full of shit and the, the police are my anchors and probation do fuck all for you but yeah. ever since wanting it to work it's worked and they've help they've offered me so much so um it was about christmas just gone i had a great christmas first time sober and um craig hughes um i don't know if you know him but he'd be a good one to get on he got his charity called the friend of mine um he's trying to get it registered but he's had a lot of people um like you know open up a bit on his facebook with their problems and he he kept messaging me saying oh i don't know how i still don't know how this day he knows but he went oh you know, say some positive stuff on your story and that to be, and I was like, okay, I'll do it. Uh, January came around and I'd done that and I had such a great response from it. It was unbelievable. People messaging me, oh my God, I related to that so much or thank you for sharing that and stuff. And I kind of looked at it and I thought, you know what, like I felt good myself talking and I've made someone else feel good. So it was like the Zoom calls and, and, and with the voluntary work because um, I was hoping that one day I'd get a job in that field. And then the talking kind of made me think, oh, my God, I could do something here. Like, you know, um, and then I met Tom uh, down uh, the barber shop. And then through lockdown, he used to come to my dad's office and uh, cut my hair in the office because I, when I got clean, I surrounded myself with good people, like you said. So every day I'd be with my dad and his business partners. Because my dad's like 10 feet tall to me. Like, you know, my mum is my mum. And like I said, it, it, it was that, not that maternal thing there. My dad is more my... Uh, role model type. My role model, yeah. Um, sorry, mum. But that's what it is <laughs> like, you know. Um, and so I start... And like, you know, my dad, they'd all have their nice cars. They, you know, they got good jobs. And so I started to hang around with them. Because one way or another, like if, if you hang around with four um, burglars, guess who's the fifth one, mate? Like, you know, and so yeah. I was hanging around with these good people. And then Tom came around the one day and I said, oh, I've done that talk. I'd love to do a podcast. He went, let's do it. And I was like, what? He was like, let's do it. I was like, okay. He said, I've just done an interview with Luca because uh, they're both barbers yeah. and Luca's uh, apprenticeship. So he was like, let's do it. Luca just done a video and he said he'd like to. So from then we just never looked back. And while all this is happening as well, I've been trying to push myself hard to try and get a job in this drug world um and that kind of paid off so th- um i actually now got a job with kaleidoscope and recovery cymru awesome mate. Uh, uh i'm the service in reach uh service in reach user for voice action and change so basically um what they're trying to do is sorry, sorry the, the apb the aerial planning board of cardiff have uh put 100 grand or 80 grand into funding to try and get more service user involvement so that could be anything from i don't know uh finding out if you know the the place they go to pick their methadone up is the right 
are the walls painted the right color is it inviting for them uh what they should be shirting just little things like that but it's just all about getting more service user involvement and a lot of people don't really want to open up just to professionals you know so I, i'm like that's what this job role was Relatable for someone who's been yeah. there before and now can do it and that's in like the huggard center which is the homeless center in cardiff people leave in prison um the methadone clinics um the rehab clinics you know all these places and this role was for this person to go out to all these places to make sure the service users had more involvement uh, and i got the job i just couldn't believe i was there the other day in newport with emma who's my manager and she was like we're gonna try and get you prison clearance i was like what prison clear i was in prison last year like behind the door and now they're trying to get me prison clearance i don't know if i'll get it but hey that's amazing like and also yeah. i think as well you doing this work it's reinforcing that good habit again, isn't it? It's yeah. like you're telling all these people why and how, and like it's just replaying in your own head, yeah. so you don't go back as well. I exactly, think, like, yeah. I think it's made for you. Like, do you know what yeah, I mean? I, well, yeah, I do as well now. I, you know, things are starting to come come to come together with me. It's like, um, like the people in Cardiff as well, like um, the, the the people on the streets, the users. They all know me. They all know what I'm about. I've been in prison with them, or I've been on the streets with them, or I've actually smoked with them, and they know how mad I was and you know, how lost I was. And if they can see that I've turned around, that's got to give them hope. Yeah. It's got to. Because there's some, this. Oh, listen, some of the people I've met, some of the people who have passed, some of the people I've met, you know, it's sad. Um, and, you know, like, uh, some of the things I've seen in Cardiff as well, it's horrific. I see, I found a dead body, um, the Kingsway building, out uh, by the Hilton Hotel with the mega buses. I found the man, he jumped off the Kingsway building. Okay. I found his dead body. I was wanted by the police, so I couldn't stay there. I had to run to the Hilton Hotel, tell him there's a body on the floor, and run away. And then it was only like the next That's day on heavy, Wales Online, it? it said uh, a man jumped to his death. But the, he was there, f face planted, and there were students behind me because it, it was live lounge Thursday night or something. And these people behind me were saying, oh, check his pulse, turn his body over. And, I, they were, and as soon as they went to turn his body, I just ran. I didn't want to see his face. But I'll, I'll always remember his body and stuff. And... That's sad, man. Yeah, that place, that's probably yeah, uh, yeah. playing on in the air now, isn't it? I can yeah, when I got sober, it did, yeah, because I played my whole uh, drug journey in my head. But some of the things that happen in Cardiff, it, it's bad, and it's in any town in the UK. Definitely, mate. You it's know, any everywhere. town in the UK. Uh, the COVID thing was a bit of a mad one because, you know, all you would see on the streets would be either drug dealers or druggies, you know, or the police when everyone was on proper lockdown. And... Um, you know, the homeless in town who, who, who count on their coffees being bought by the person who works in Admiral or, you know, or... Yeah, and and and, 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 and and they... And I, I what I noticed as well was um, you've seen homeless people on the council estates outside the shops. They'd be sitting, you know, you'd see homeless people sat trying to beg outside the shop on your council estate because there's no one in town. Yeah. And that's what I was seeing during lockdown. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't even... Think about the impact they had for, on the addicts, how they were making their money, or or the homeless. You know, it's it's mad. It's Mate, mad. This whole this whole situation is crazy, isn't it? And that I don't know. I seen like a advert at the start of it all. They reckon they homed all the homeless, and I was just like bullshit. Like, innit? Uh, well, maybe not bullshit. Oh, I well, I seen one. Uh, they they homed them in the Winford. I'm just gutted the Winford's not knocked down. The Winford's just some mad club everyone used to go in. If you couldn't pull up, pull a bird there, you're gay, basically. That's <laughs> what yeah. they used to say, anyway. Like, but apparently they homed them there. Like, but um, I don't know. I still seen quite a lot of people on the streets. I still seen people, you know, struggling. And do you know what's the biggest thing as well about homelessness? I find in Cardiff, it's not even it's not even the ones in town. The drugs. Do you know how many people I know, young people, friends, who are sofa surfing on the council estates of Fairwater, the council estates of Ely, the council estates of Lam Remney? They've got nowhere to stay. Uh, a friend of mine, um, a girl, she knows what I'm talking about, yeah, but she rings me up. She's like she's like a fairy godmother to people, and she helps loads of people. She had someone staying in her house who just lived on the same estate of her, and the hug he didn't want to go to the hugger centre because it was that bad with drugs and stuff, and he knew... And the amount of people who are homeless on... Not in the centre because they're on drugs, just on the council estate, it's horrific. It's mad. And I, 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 I don't know how we can change that, but something needs to be done clearly. Well, you're putting yourself in the position to try... Yeah. Which is great, mate, and uh, got a lot of respect for it. Listen, like the, obviously, we're doing this podcast now as well, like the Central Club. Um, it's mad that I'm on your podcast now, but it's good. Like you know, working together is great as well. 
I just, I'm doing the podcast for a platform for Cardiff, a platform for Wales, you know, because uh, there's a lot of talent out there, as you know, in Wales and, you know, uh, UK in general. But, you know, I'm not saying I got all the answers. I'm not. But if I can open up my story and if I can relate to someone or put a smile on someone's face, I'm going to do it, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, um, I know I've done wrong in the past and stuff, but um, I'm really trying to correct that now in work and in the podcast. Well, mate, like no one's perfect. Everyone's a work in progress. You only got you only got to take one step at a time and just keep plodding on, mate. Yeah, and I exactly. think the steps you've made so far in 10 months are massive. Like you're a different person from the photos I've seen yeah. and stuff. You're just a totally different person. You've got a positive outlook. You're doing positive things with positive people, mate. And I think... From year on out, just, yeah, keep that promise to yourself. And, yeah. uh, you'll do amazing things, mate. And Most definitely. You know, like you said, we'll work together on things. Anything we can 100%, do, we'll fucking like make I, it happen. Like. 100%. Anyone you, anyone you, like, you know, if you see come on our podcast, we'd be more than happy to just send them your way and vice versa. Same, mate. Um, I, I think it's a good thing that this is happening in Wales. Uh, you know, it's enough. You know, England, they always get. Let, let's build each other up as well, isn't it? Not break each other down. Exactly. Like, let's fucking. That, I want to say this now, yeah. This is one thing, right, which has been a weakness in the Welsh music scene, Cardiff especially, massively. I know because I, you know, I love my music. It's that crab bucket mentality. Yeah. You know. It's hard to make it out. So when you are doing it, you don't want to let you don't want to let it go. You don't want to share it. You know, I think the Univision, you know, the the togetherness, the togetherness, the togetherness, no. <laughs> the togetherness <laughs> is what will make us prevail. That is what's going to get us stronger in this. And okay, if you want to not change that in the music scene, let's do it in the podcast world, isn't it? Hundred percent, mate. Let's do it. Hey, thank you very much for coming on, Callum, man. Yeah, man. I really appreciate really, your story's powerful. And uh, to anyone who's watching, just get over, follow this man, follow their podcast as well. They're doing great things. Yeah, the Central Club. Uh, we're on uh, every Sunday, 8 p.m. Uh, we have a new guest every week. Uh, it's probably the same as you. Like, it, There's no preference to our guests. As long as they've got a positive story and an inspirational story, you know, positive message, that, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're all for, you know. And we're just there to make people laugh, smile, and just take their minds off this rubbish world we're in at the moment, isn't it? 100% mate big respect thanks thank for coming on much. cheers Thank-day. mate thank Legend. you real real nice thank, thank you thank you bro